In therapy, though, we know what needs to be done. We need to reduce the brain volume, stop the blood-brain barrier leak, and relieve the hypoxia. So how do we do that medically? And this is in your handouts. We want to improve oxygenation. Three or four breaths of oxygen will immediately cause cerebral vasoconstriction and reduce cerebral blood flow and reduce brain volume. And typically, within 10 minutes in our clinic, somebody with a bad headache will feel better on oxygen. So oxygen always works, and it's great, and there's no downside to it. Descent always works. Hyperbarics work, but then the patient's still at high altitude when they get out. And um, sometimes all you can do is ask somebody to consciously hyperventilate. They'll feel better. Diamox is useful. We'll talk about that. Lasix we don't use anymore. The real wonder drug for treating mountain sickness is dexamethasone. We don't know the mechanism. We think that it stops blood-brain barrier leak, but that's a pretty broad statement. We think it stabilizes the endothelium. That's a pretty broad statement, too. We don't know exactly what it does, but it works. A lot of people only need symptomatic treatment. They just need some ibuprofen for their headache or some codeine and some antiemetics. And Zofran is a wonder drug. It should be carried in the medical kits of everyone going to high altitude because it's not sedating like uh, the promethazine or prochlorperazine and uh, it does a great job. So we use a lot of Zofran at our clinic. Sublingual comes sublingual so they don't even have to swallow it. Now uh, in the Himalaya we used to take everybody down in helicopters if they got really sick. Now we know that's not necessary and in fact it often causes too, many, too much delay. You better, if you have somebody who's really sick in the Sierra Nevada, for example, where I used to work at 12,000 feet, gurgling chest, much better off to start carrying him or put him on a horse and head down than to go send a runner to the ranger station to call a helicopter because by the time that chopper lands, the patient could well be dead. That happened a lot when I was working in Mammoth Lakes. Here's a hyperbaric bag. Uh, we can put a patient inside here and pump it up, and it's just like taking them down to about 6,000 feet in altitude, and it works very well. But then when you take them out, they're still at high altitude, and they might get sick again. Or these get really nice and rigid, and they slide very well on steep, icy slopes. You shoot them down. You have to be a little careful working with hyperbaric bags. I don't think it's going to work. Never mind. So you should know a little bit about uh, acetazolamide or Diamox because your patients will ask you about it. How many of you have your patients come with something printed out from the internet in their hand when they show up at your office? Yeah, it happens a lot. And uh, there's a lot on the internet about Diamox and using it. And the way it works is that it's carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, so it produces a metabolic acidosis. That's normally what your body does. So right now, if you've been here for 48 hours, your serum bicarb has already dropped from 25 to about 22. And if, if you were up at 9,000 feet, it would drop from 25 to about 20. That's because your kidneys are compensating for your respiratory alkalosis. And your PCO2 in Florida is 40. Here at Big Sky, is going to be about 34. And at 9,000 feet, it's going to be about 32. So you're, everyone here is hyperventilating. You're alkalotic. Your kidneys compensate. And when your kidneys compensate, you're bringing your pH more back towards normal, you actually even breathe a little bit more. So your oxygen saturation will be maximal here after two to three days. If you take Diamox, that happens in four hours. Your serum bicarb drops from 25 to 20 in four hours. So it just it mimics the natural process of acclimatization. Or the way I like to think of it is it speeds the natural process of acclimatization. It does not mask symptoms. It can't mask symptoms. It's not a painkiller. It can't kill a headache that way. The reason people feel better on Diamox is because they're better acclimatized. And it does all these other things as well. So the dose in your handouts, you, you've got it. We're, most of us now are going to the lower dose, 125 milligrams twice a day, starting the day before travel and the first couple of days at altitude. If a person has um, a history of allergy to sulfonamide antibiotics, they're probably not going to cross-react with sulfonamide non-antibiotics, but they might. And so a test dose might be useful to make sure. If it's a history of anaphylaxis to sulfonamides, you don't want to give them Diamox. 
And then side effects are dose-related, which is why we like to use a smaller dose. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Dexamethasone, as I mentioned, is the wonder drug. This is an old slide, but it shows a symptom score going from very high to very low. Now, this shows 12 hours, but that's because that was our measuring point. But in reality, in about four hours, people improved dramatically on dexamethasone. So how did this client of ours that's going to uh, Peru, how do we tell him to prevent altitude illness? We tell him that if you can avoid going straight from sea level to 9,000 feet in a day, that's nice. He says, sorry, I got to fly to Cusco, which is 11,300. So we say, OK, you can't do that. And then you, you want to make sure that he acclimatizes at Cusco for a couple days at least before going any higher, ideally four days. Now, since he doesn't have time to acclimatize, he might consider prophylaxis, especially if he has a past history of mountain sickness. He said he got sick in Colorado. You question him, and he says, yeah, I, I got a headache, and I couldn't sleep well. That's mountain sickness. No diarrhea. And uh, so he might be a candidate for prophylaxis with a, either acetazolamide, which is the drug of choice. You can use dexamethasone, but we, we want to reserve that for treatment. There's some evidence showing that just prophylactic aspirin and ibuprofen might be enough, or even ginkgo, 100 milligrams a couple times a day. But by far, uh, acetazolamide is the tested and true and uh, agent and the drug of choice for preventing mountain sickness. Who needs it? Oh, I got ahead of myself here. So there's a, uh, there's a tendency uh, to, to diss acetazolamide or not use it as much. It's funny, I talk to these European climbers all the time, and they say, oh, no, we do not use Diamox. We are very strong. We climb to the summit, no drugs. You say, OK. And they're dragging all these people behind them who are getting sick from the altitude. They have nothing to do with their strength, and their guide thinks it's because they're weak. It has only to do with acclimatization. But anyhow, that, I don't want to get off on a tirade about that. <laughs> then I asked this guide, do you, do you windsurf? Of course I windsurf. I am an expert to windsurf. What do you do for, for seasickness? Well, I take drugs, of course. Oh, so you'll take drugs to go windsurfing because you're putting your body in an environment where there's going to be some reaction to it. But you won't allow anybody to take it when they go to high altitude. What's the difference? Well, I don't know. I never thought of that. So the difference is with seasickness, you might want to die. Whereas with mountain sickness, you really don't, usually. And uh, the side effects, of, believe me, how many of you have ever taken scopolamine or dramamine for motion sickness or seasickness? I mean, the, the side effects of Diamox are far less than the side effects of scopolamine or dramamine. So that's just my bit about that. Well, you could, if you could tell your client if he wants to fork out $10,000, he can buy this tent and put it over his bed. And he can sleep at a simulated altitude of 12,000 feet for a week before he goes. And that'll definitely work. So he's just got an oxygen concentrator turned around backwards, so it's pumping nitrogen into the tent. And it simulates higher altitude. His wife might get a headache, though. So <clears throat> to summarize a lot of this stuff on altitude sickness, th this slide shows two things. One. Errors in judgment take place. I uh, ran the same roll of film through my retinal camera and through my regular camera by mistake and got Mount Everest here on somebody's retina. But it also reminds us that it's a study of vascular biology. Altitude illness has to do with leakiness of blood vessels, the endothelium. It's an endothelial problem. And uh, so that's a nice way to think of it. <laughs>